Spike.
Andre the petrol gets from the back to the front on that car. thought you might like to take a close look at this car, which the expert in the family, I'm certain by now, will have said, that's a Model T Ford. Well, he's nearly right, but not quite, because this is a Model N, which is the forerunner of the Model T. Now, to show you inside, I'll have to take the bonnet off. That's fairly simple. You just simply lift it off. And inside, we start with the radiator, which was brass, and they were brass until 1917 when they started to make them of, 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 of uh, steel. Going down the radiator, we come to the water pump, which is here, circulates the water. We've got just an ordinary transfer spring, like a buggy, a horse and cart. The axle is very simple, with Ackerman steering, but with no brakes, of course, and wooden wheels with the no non-detachable rims. Now inside the engine compartment, starting again at the front, we've got a very heavy flywheel which doubles up um, for a fan. So that's the yellow bit. I'll just wiggle it. There we go. And on this side we have the uh, oil pump which shows the oil level there and feeds each of the individual bearings inside. It's four cylinders, as I said, very advanced for its age uh, of 1906 because um, it's over square, meaning the pistons are wider than, than they're long. Four cylinders and a dry sump. This always amuses me on Model T's because it's the, it's the steering column and it's always very wobbly. Beautifully made of brass again. That is the accelerator or hand throttle, there's no foot accelerator, and this controls the spark. Driving the thing is um, very simple once you get used to it. There's no clutch. The outside um, lever here for your foot is the handbrake, as it were, because that stays down. That is the foot brake, and that is the reverse lever. You push that, you go backwards. This is the, the gear lever to go forwards. You push it, and you go forwards. You pull it, and you go back. It's got two gears forward, one back. The lamps are paraffin. If you want to dip them, I suppose you turn this down, and you get a duller light. The ignition is the magneter is on the flywheel and here is a in this beautiful little mahogany box we've got um, the trembler coils. Now Henry Ford was born in 18, um, 
63, died in 1947. And in, the, in those 84 years, he built thousands and thousands of cars, and we shall hear about that in a little while. But he did build 25,000 of these type of cars in various models before we got to the famous Model T, which our film is all about. So that tells you very briefly of the forerunner to the Model T. Let's now go and have a really good ride in one. Apart from the very distinguished radiator of the Rolls-Royce, probably the best-known motor car front in the world is the Model T Ford. Cheeky, you may say, to put the most expensive and cheapest cars in the world in the same bracket. Nevertheless, at one end of the scale is the Rolls-Royce, majestic, dignified, aloof, and out of reach of most people's pockets. At the other end of the scale is the car about which its builder said would put the world on wheels. It did just that, for in the 19 years from 1908 to 1927, Henry Ford built 15,007,033 of them. The society or association representing today's comparatively few Model T owners and those who are just enthusiastic about them is called the Model T Register. This year in late summer, they held their Model T run. The coming of the Model T in the mid-twenties must have caused the demise of more horses and horse-drawn vehicles than any single happening. It seems ironic, therefore, that the Model T run should start at Newmarket, the acknowledged home of the aristocrats of the equine world. The local residents didn't seem to mind too much. To them, it was just a few more in the constant stream of smelly, whirring, horseless carriages that now and again backfire, and which humans seem so fond of. Not a patch on good grass, very doubtful ancestry, and no breeding. Compared with the elegant carriages it replaced, the Model T was unquestionably ugly, uncompromisingly erect, funereally drab. But it combined the sure-footedness of a duck with the agility of a mountain goat, and the tenacity of a mule. It could go anywhere except into some stratas of society for its snob value was rock bottom. The 1981 Model T register run was soon out of Newmarket and onto the Downs. Starting early on Sunday morning, there wasn't very much traffic about, just a few rather surprised conventional motorists in their snug little boxes, who to a driver or passenger gave a cheery wave to the colorful convoy of Model Ts. Although Henry Ford is reputed to have said that he would supply any color Model T as long as it was black, many have since had owners with different ideas and this year's convoy of Model T's was as colourful as a flight of parakeets, and some of them chattered like them too. During the early years of its production, not only was it only available in black, but it came in basic form. No self-starter, just a crank at the front. No speedometer, you guessed how fast you were going. No temperature gauge, it usually ran too hot. And no oil gauge, because nobody bothered very much, and the wheels were not removable if you got a puncture. However, the rims were, or you could buy an accessory called a Stepney, which was another rim complete with tyre that bolted on the outside of the punctured wheel so that you came home with a double wheel on the offending corner. I thought it was a backfire at first, but I was going along it seemed all right at the time. <laughs> In those pioneering days, it was a brave motorist indeed who ventured out onto the very poor or even non-existent road surfaces without at least two spare covers, many tubes, plenty of patches and a pump.
It was small wonder that by the end of its production run, there were 5,000 accessories and conversions on offer. Ford did eventually make the tea in other forms, as buses or charabangs, lorries or trucks, vans or fire tenders. But you could buy a host of other bits and pieces from various manufacturers, a conversion to turn it into a farm tractor, an arrangement so that it could be used as a stationary engine to pump water, saw wood, or generate electricity. The Model T was truly the universal mechanical workhorse. There is no doubt that in their day, most owners had a sort of love-hate relationship with their tin lizzies, although there were all sorts of wrinkles to make life easier, like jacking up the back wheel when starting it on cold mornings, or approaching steep hills backwards as reverses a lower gear than the two forward ones. Today, anyone who is fortunate enough to own one is enthusiastic to the point that he can bore for England on the subject, or he is a masochist and enjoys punishment. Eventually, the convoy of teas arrived at their destination, the Aircraft Museum at Duxford. The two questions that are usually put to Model T owners by spectators are, how fast will they go and what are they worth? Well, the answer is they're comfortable at 35 miles an hour, they become unsafe at 45 miles an hour, and over that they play nearer my God to thee. What's the worth of a Model T? Well, it's worth whatever two people will give for it. And anybody with a grain of sense treats them with the utmost respect. They never race them. A name synonymous with Model T's in this part of the world is Clifford Gott. Clifford, it's a lovely job you got here. What's the history of it? Well, uh, I purchased it from a friend uh, who brought it over to America in 1978. And uh, I restored it in six months from then. October 78 to February 8 or 79. Well, now, it's not unusual in most respects, but you do have a rear windscreen for the rear passengers. What's the idea well, of that? Well, yes, uh, uh, they were component manufacturers at that time of day, and they uh, made them to put on the cars, you see, and uh, I acquired this at Burley one year, and I thought I'd like to put it on. The, my wife complained about the draft mm -hmm. in the back, so I thought, well, we'll put that... You know, right. Well, my wife just complains. I'll probably put one in mine to keep her in the back. Oh, yeah, so you can't hear them. That's right. <laughs> That's it, yeah. With respect, you seem very young to be as interested in Model T's as some people are. How did that happen? Well, it was one Christmas. I was with uh, my uncle, John Brazel, and he said uh, he wanted to take his old car on the London to Brighton run. And uh, he said, would I enter it and get it organised? So I got the car out of this van out of the shed and uh, entered it. And we went down the London to Brighton run. Mm. How does it. she go? She goes really well. Mm. Um, I've rebuilt the engine, um, which has improved it and given it more power. Mr. Chester, what's the significance of a different sort of radiator? Well, it was made by a uh, firm in the States that uh, made this sort of equipment for, particularly for speedsters and uh, mostly because it had an increased water capacity of about between four and five gallons mm. as the falls, as you know. So she didn't boil? That's, mm. Yes. That now, see, you've got an L plate on. Yes, well, uh, it's my wife's car, actually, but my grandson's been driving it throughout this rally, and he's only just 17. And, well, uh, I hope he remembers when he gets back in another car that the well, difference in the footlinks. He's got two chances, I think, in that respect. <laughs> yeah. Now for the inspection and the awards for spit and polish. Well, if we can now come to the presentation of the prizes, I'll deal with the best brass first, and that has been won by Dick Joyce with the 1906 Model N. The prizes will be presented by Mrs. Whiteway, who is the wife of our president, of course, Eric. <laughs> Thank you very, very well much. done, Dick. Yes. Thanks, Thank you very much. I think really, uh, 
I think David Breton should have had his, this because he's the man who prepared the car. Thank you very much. And that has been won. There were lots of prizes, but winning prizes wasn't the name of the game. The idea of entering the Model T register for its run was just for fun. Well, David, I don't know. I'm a bit embarrassed because we seem to have won the cup for the best prepared car, but really, um, the credit is due to you. You prepared it, I now own it, but just give us a brief history of it. Well, briefly, the car I bought, uh, as you know, about three, four years ago, in a pretty derelict state, and um, I think the chap that I bought it from didn't really know what he'd got for sale, really, and so we managed to negotiate a, a reasonable price for the state it was in, and um, brought it home, and started to collect bits and pieces for it to restore it. And how long did it take you? About three years altogether. How many store, hours yes. do you reckon? Oh, a couple of times. Yes, a lot of yeah. love. Yes, yes. Well, yes. anyhow, congratulations yes. to you. I've, I've never owned anything that's given me so much pleasure. I'm that's most great. grateful. Good. Well, it's a pleasure to see somebody that owns it and enjoys it, I must say. Thank you, David. Thank you. And so we come to the end of what can only be described as a very successful Model T register rally. And perhaps it's appropriate that we should stop at exactly this point. For behind me is the 1974 version of the Concorde. It's a sobering thought, you know, that this car was built in 1906 and it still goes. That one was built a long time later. Doesn't go anymore. Cheerio. <laughs> <laughs>